You're listening to Thunder Quack Podcast Network. Welcome to the very first episode of the Irregularly Scheduled Podcast. I am, of course, your host, Michael Cohen. Thank you for joining me. I know this has been a long time coming, and you guys have been very patient with me as we get other projects off the ground, uh, and I know that everybody's been been really champing at the bit to uh, to to hear what Irregularly Scheduled is going to be, um, and they want to hear me talk about all sorts of topics other than the ones that I normally cover uh, on the Rebels podcast and Quiver the Green Hour podcast, the stuff you're used to hearing me talk about. Um, Irregularly Scheduled is going to be just that. It's going to be my opportunity to talk to you guys, the listeners, about all sorts of different things, uh, whether it's geeky stuff, but hopefully more often than not, we'll be talking about other neat things like uh, uh, science and uh, uh, you know just sort of interesting stories, interesting concepts, maybe some politics, maybe some philosophy, stuff like that. Things that I'm into that might not necessarily have copyright infringement uh, involved in creating podcasts podcasts about them. So I, uh, with that in mind, we're going to do the complete opposite. And in this first episode, uh, Amanda and I are going to talk about uh, Harry Potter. Uh, I'm, I'm currently in the process of going through the series for the first time. Obviously, I've seen all the movies um, as they came out in the movie theater. Uh, and and I've seen I've seen all but the first two in the theater. So uh, so, I you know, I, I've become a pretty big fan over the course of the years. But I uh, but had never read the books because I'm just not much of a reader. It's not really my thing. But Thankfully, they became available on audiobook recently, so I started going through, and uh, at the time that we recorded this segment, uh, I had gotten through the first three books, and and uh, and currently now, as of, as of me recording this intro, I'm about halfway, maybe about two-thirds of the way through the, the fourth book. Um, so this conversation is going to be relegated specifically to that content, uh, the first three books, Um, and, and I'll tell you, I mean, the fourth book, my, my opinions haven't really changed. Uh, the stuff that we talk about still holds true, but, uh, but that said, when I do finish the series, we will come back and Amanda and I will discuss, uh, the final four books in the series, but that'll probably take a little while because they get bigger and bigger with each book. So, I uh, so without further ado, uh, here we go. And you can have a listen to that conversation between me and my co-host from Quiver the Green Arrow podcast, Amanda Konkin. Uh, here we go. Okay. So the, here's my complaints so far. The yeah, plot, Harry Potter, right? Yeah, Harry Potter. The first book, mm-hmm. the plot breaks down in the last act because um, all of this stuff happens and it's all the setup, blah, blah, blah. And then they get through, he gets through all of the trials or whatever, not the trials, but like the the, things the, just, the safeguards yeah. to yeah. get to the to the stone. And and then, and then what's his face? Quirrell mm-hmm. confesses, right? Like he tells him everything. If Quirrell gave Hagrid the dragon egg mm-hmm. and found out the the secret to to Fluffy mm-hmm. at the point in time that he actually did, why did he wait months to get through? Like, to, to get to the end of the thing, right? The movie fixes it, I think. It's been a really long time since I've watched the movie, mm-hmm. but I think in the movie... Quirrell comes in and basically says, "Oh, thank you very much, Mister Potter. You've you you led me right to the blah 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 or whatever, right? Like, I couldn't. I, I made it past everything, but I couldn't figure out the the last thing or whatever or something like that. 
But in the book, in the book, that doesn't happen. Yeah. In the in I, the. I think it happens the same in the book and the movie. I feel like, like he, I feel he like just went through beforehand. You think, yeah, because in the because in the book he's already through, and Harry, yeah. and Hermione, and Ron are Come like afterwards. chasing after him, yeah, right? Yeah. Um, but it doesn't make any sense because like Fluffy was the one thing that he couldn't get past, right? Like it's like he kind of says that it's like I thought the whole <clears> point was that he had to learn what the other people would have put in it. So yeah. the first thing he found out was Hagrid's Fluffy. And then the rest of the stuff, he had to figure out which professor was doing what so that he could know what it was going to yeah. be. See, I feel I feel like there was a line where he said something about Fluffy being the hardest part. Oh, okay. Right? Like, but Because he doesn't talk about the rest of it. He doesn't talk about, about like... Uh, like like the the stuff that McGonagall does and and the stuff that yeah. that Snape does and whatever the only person that he talks about is it's Hagrid is Hagrid yeah and and he and he goes to like such lengths to be like oh it, it, it it's not even clever it's right. just like it's so just... here's here's my response to that yeah. Uh, it happens at the end because that's what ne- it needed to, I know. to facilitate. So like I'm, I know, but I it's know, sloppy. but but I'm working on a movie right now. Yeah. We're like, if you look at it that way, there's no point for us to even make the movie. The whole point is, enjoy the fun. Like, it happens because, that way because it happens that way. Yeah, like, I, th- I, th- I, think <laughs> I think you're comparing apples to oranges on that one. Because I think the movie that you're working on is, if, if it's the, the one that I think it is, like, it's like that, it, it, the, the whole excuse for that movie is just fun. Yeah. Right. Harry Potter is a little bit different. It's a children's book. It's no, the same. But no, it's not the same because it's it's built as it, it's meant to have a structure, yeah. and it's it's no different. It's mm-hmm. no different than you get to the end of season one of Doctor Who, and Bad Wolf is the thing, mm-hmm. and like and it doesn't make any sense. It makes no sense. Like like other than there's there's like two instances in the whole season. Where Bad Wolf was something that actually affected the plot line. Yeah. But the rest of it, it was just words that were written or a thing that was said off the cuff. Yeah. Right? There was, there was like, there's the one episode where they're, they're, they're trying to escape from the one place, some place, mm-hmm. and like, Bad Wolf is written and, and they know not to go that way or something. Or it's, something. It's, it like so, warns them off of something. Did but you like, watch the 50th anniversary special? Are you talking about Doctor Who? Yeah. No, of course not. Okay, well, they, they brought back Bad Wolf in that. You can't retcon it years no, later. I, that no, doesn't no, no, count. they didn't. Well, okay. but it's just the thing where <laughs> I don't remember the... Because, again, I watched what, the first season of Doctor Who, like, a, yeah. ages ago. Uh, oh, man, I should be Well, it's that. been a really long so time good. since I've watched it, too. Um. Oh, my gosh. Is that a picture of your baby? Yeah. Oh. Anyway, sorry. Um... <laughs> I don't know. Anyways, what is your like larger point about Harry Potter? Because if we if we argue minutia, I no, feel no. Like it, like, just so was... like that's that's my that's just my first cry. Yes, your first cry. Let's move on to the next one. <clears throat> like mostly they're awesome. Like, like mostly yeah. they're great stories. Um, the the biggest gripe that I have is J.K. Rowling herself <laughs> because I just think that she's kind of an obnoxious person. But <clears throat> like I can divorce I can divorce the art from the artist, and that that's fine, <gasps> right? Like. It's not a big deal because it's like I can like I watched Ender's Game a while back mm-hmm. and I enjoyed that movie for what it was. I mean, it's a little bit of a stupid ending, but um, I similar types of issues that I have with the end of the first Harry Potter book. But Orson Scott Card the, is a terrible person. Oh, yeah. But also <clears throat> the point of Ender's Game is the ending of the. Okay. I, know, I know, but, like, I, it, the, but I haven't seen the movie. I've read the book. But, but, like, but the end of Ender's Game is is it's the point. Is a, but it's a little bit obnoxious. Of course, there there's obnoxious stuff like oh, we're just gonna let him take a ship and go off into the like whatever. I don't want to talk about Ender's <laughs> Game. But the whole point is that like Orson Scott, Scott Card is a horrible person. person. Yeah. But Ender's Game is an interesting story, and I can watch Ender's Game and not be and like, yeah, and yeah. not let that affect how I feel about yeah. that story. Um, similarly, I can I can read Harry well, listen to Harry Potter, mm-hmm. <clears throat> watch the movies certainly because mm-hmm. I love the movies, um, and divorce it from J.K. Rowling mm-hmm. and some of her more obnoxious traits in my eyes. But um, okay, so so the end of the first book bothers me a little bit. Um, 
the 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 thing that bugs me the most other than JK Rowling herself is that every book starts with them with, with her insulting the Dursleys. Mm-hmm. And I guess I get it. The Dursleys are bad guys. They're bad guys. They're bad people. They might not be they might not be evil wizards, but they're bad people, right? Um. But, but, I mean, like, by the end of the story, I know that, like, it kind of turns itself around and eventually his, his aunt... They're, they're not kind... bad. They're supposed to be foils for what his actual parents are. Okay, I'm listening through them right now and okay. it's all very fresh. They're okay. terrible people. Okay. The book, they, like, the books imply that, yeah. that his uncle beat him regularly. No. Okay. Right? Like that like that that was part of his growing up. Like I have no idea what the what the child welfare system is like in the UK, mm-hmm. but if people mm-hmm. find this to be a believable story that a well to do family in a in a yeah. suburb in the in the UK could yeah. could treat a human being like a child that they are the guardians of yeah. in this way, like that it, it astounds me. In any case, I understand why it's in there for the story. But that's not my point. My like like they're bad people. Uh-huh. We get it because of their actions. We understand they're bad people because of what they do. Yeah. But Rowling has this, and she does. It's not just the Dursleys, but they're the best example. Um, because I don't know the name of the other characters or whatever, but they're the best example of this. Their exterior is meant to reflect who they are as people. Oh right, yeah. And it really bothers me because they are children's books. And she's putting the idea in people's heads that ugly people, that fat people, that that messy people are bad guys a lot of the time. Like, I know there's a few things yeah. about, like, Hermione has, has crazy hair and, and Harry has crazy hair that won't stay down or whatever. So there's some, some of these things transfer. But a lot of the time when she's explaining, like, when she's describing characters... It's very, very like put down language, right? Yeah. It's very, it's very like like I'm I'm at the beginning of the fourth book, which like in the in the movies I don't remember them really spending this much time on it. She goes to great lengths to tell you that that uh, Dudley, yeah, yeah, that Dudley is fat. Okay, and. To the point where I, like, this is fresh in my mind, because literally as I got off the bus and was walking up yeah. to my house, it, it, this was playing in my ears. She compares him to a killer whale. Mm. He's he's roughly the weight of a killer whale. And it's like, I that's hyperbole. It's not written as hyperbole. It's written as a literal, like a literal yeah. statement, <clears throat> which is just... Bad writing, in my mm-hmm. opinion, was some of the things that I yeah. that I take issue with in her yeah. writing, because um, <clears throat> I feel like when you're writing for kids, you have to you have to take extra care with that stuff, to be... right? Because you're impressing things upon them, and that's why this bothers me so... that like so many of the characters, even though their actions are vile and reprehensible, yeah. the, it it she almost spends more time telling you that they're disgusting people on the outside. And then gets to the point of them being disgusting people on the inside. And to me, it really, like, like, we never, like, she never describes Seamus. She never describes, uh, I almost swore. (laughs) She never describes any of, like, Harry's pals because we're just going to go ahead and assume that they're all average people. Mm. Right? So, I'm really excited that you're, like, analyzing the book in this way because two things. Uh, They were written, what, like, more than a decade, 15 years ago, right? Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. And in England. So, yeah. like, the, just, like, having been to England a couple times and, like, having relatives from there. The culture is the, different. It's, it's a different kind of culture yeah. in terms of, like, how you address stuff. Yeah. And, and like, the way that society yeah. works. It's just really interesting, especially, like, I, in more recent years, like, yeah. like learning more about um, reality TV in England and things. Anyways. Yeah. So, that's awesome that you are, like, analyzing, like, this way. But, like, in terms of, like, in her defense, which I really don't want to do. So, I'm just kind of doing this to play devil's advocate yeah. right here. But it's the idea that, like storytelling has done this for years right like that's yeah, like the whole but, the whole but, thing is that that's why yeah. like dark haired villains are a thing and yeah. light haired princesses like so it's it's slowly changing but at the time she was yeah. writing very much on par with like but but I feel like like there's a there's a personal agenda behind that 
There totally is. Like, you can see her personal leanings. Or or, or she just wasn't thinking about it in the way that we do now. No, but that's what... But right? No, I'm not saying that she wrote it, like, with intent or malice. Mm-hmm. I'm saying that, like, her subconscious is that, like, she finds fat people disgusting. Yeah. So... Which, up until ten years ago, everybody in the sure, world did. Sure, sure. Right? It's only been in the last yeah, ten years the last that, 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 like, that, that language fat shaming's even been a yeah. thing. Which For sure. Way sure. to go, Wentworth Miller. By the way, did you? Yeah, 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 yeah. No, Wentworth so Miller. Sad. Like, and and I don't know. Maybe like, well, I mean that this. I've been thinking about this before that happened, but maybe because that's so fresh in my mind, mm-hmm. um, I'm just like it's now sort of yeah, like thing, yeah. And it, it's interesting because it's something that's really like it's it's when she, when you're with the Dursleys. It is like cranked up to eleven. Right. Yeah. The rest of the book, it's not nearly as bad. Yeah. And sometimes it's used. Sometimes it's used to, um. Like like it's used it's used in a subversive way. Like she sets mm-hmm. that up with the Dursleys, and then there's definitely an aspect of of Remus Lupin when you first meet him. He's disheveled. He's mm-hmm. like he's described as as being shabby and like yeah. sort of the the character that in the other two books previous to that mm-hmm. Harry would want to avoid, <clears throat> and then you end up finding out that Remus is actually one of the best allies that Harry mm-hmm. will ever have, and you know like all that mm-hmm. sort of thing. Um, Remus is like my second is, favorite. Is character. Tom Riddle yeah. in the third book? Uh, Tom Riddle's in the second book. Oh yeah, yeah, yeah. And, th- and that's one of the other things is that Tom Riddle is is described as being handsome. Yeah. Right? So I'm just thinking. I I feel like it may detract a little bit. This isn't a spoiler. So well, much. I mean, I know the stories already. Yeah, so exactly. But like, there's a distinct shift, like. Yeah. Dudley becomes very like he's no longer described as fat in like the sixth book. Okay. It's that he like has become a football star. Okay. And it's like a thing that he's like yeah, 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 buff yeah. and like popular and so yeah. he like completely changes and he's still a like he's still a bad guy, he just is a different So it's just so yeah, it's very intentional the way that they're described, but it's it shifts to a different kind of um, yeah. description of him in in like what he it's not so juvenile. And I think yeah. maybe that's a thing too, like as she grew as a writer and as the characters grew, the way that they looked at the world grew as yeah. well. So yeah. that this idea of when you're talking to like 12 year old kids 20 years ago, yeah. there was very much this mentality of being like, oh, they're so big and dumb and stupid. And yeah, yeah, yeah. Right? And so kids are like, oh, yeah, it's the very, like, are like big it, and dumb and stupid. Yeah, like I said, like it's, it's put down language. Yeah. Like it's a lot of very insulting sort of thing. The sort of thing that, and these are things that I'm thinking about now, mm-hmm. that when you're raising a kid, you would say, hey, don't talk like that. Yeah. Right? Yeah, like, yeah. we don't call people that name. We don't use that word. Yeah. Right? Like, don't call your sister stupid. Yeah. Right? Stuff like that. Um, and and sh- here is J.K. Rowling with an audience of basically every child on the planet that has access to a book. Right, yeah. Right? Using this language. Using this language. And so it's just really interesting because now it's something that when when my kids get to that age and they are given the Harry Potter books to read. It's like, okay, you, you like you've moved on to this stage of your life. Here's Harry Potter. It's going to be like you re, when you're done the first 3 chapters, come back to me because <laughs> I have to talk to you about this. Oh, yeah. Because the way that she talks about the Dursleys, yes, they're bad people, but yeah. it has nothing to do with the way that they look. Yeah. And you can't assume that everybody who's fat or likes to eat or blah yeah. blah blah, right? Like like yeah. he, she uses a lot of descriptors that are just like they're very superficial mm-hmm. and and I uh, they're very like they're very shame based right mm-hmm. and it it's I uh, it's it's a really weird thing and I guess like it probably is a, a 2016 perspective on it mm-hmm. and people who were reading the books or experiencing this stuff a little bit closer to when it came out probably weren't as as I. Uh, <clears throat> aware of this this sort of thing well, this is just so but it's just still like there are some points where i'm like i don't care i don't care when these books were published i don't think that that's an acceptable way to talk about a child okay, yeah. in the context of, of a children's book and an adversary because you're you're really like you're loading a gun with with potentially dangerous bullets yeah. right like so i don't it's it's just 
of all of the things that I went into it thinking that I would have a problem with, <clears throat> this was not on my radar. Right, yeah. Because obviously the Dursleys are bad guys. Yeah. Right? And obviously most of Slytherin are bad guys. <laughs> but, like, the one girl in Slytherin in, in the second book that they that Hermione's supposed to make the polyjuice potion out of and oh, she yeah, ends yeah, up yeah. using the cat hair. Yeah. <clears throat> like, they... They play it off like, like oh, oh, that's disgusting. And I mean, they do the same thing with Crab and Goyle, but Crab and Goyle are just kind of described as being, as being brutes, yeah, right? Like, like they're not should, really yeah. described that much. Yeah. But, but this is another one of those things, like Crab and Goyle, who are in every book and they're main characters, right? Like, I'd say they're part of the main supporting cast. Yeah. And then here's this other girl that I can't even remember her name because she's only ever mentioned in the second book and only because it's important to the plot that we have the name of a female Slytherin so that Hermione can right. use the polyjuice potion, right? Yeah. When she is described, it is in almost excruciating detail of like the, her skin complexion and her hair mm. and her weight and the way that she carries herself and it's all negative. Right. And to me, it's like you're giving this book to tweens mm -hmm. and you're and you're telling them that the bad guy looks a certain way mm -hmm. and you're you're basically giving them the ammunition to go out into their world and find a person that looks like that description and go like I bet she would be in Slytherin yeah. and then everybody can snicker about it right like that that to me like that's I don't know as an adult writing a story that's the sort of thing that you need to be careful of, right? Like I'm, I'm, uh, I'm, I'm going to be working with Allison from the Double X Files podcast on a Christmas book Ooh, for kids. Nice. Cool. They they explains like other other faiths, other oh, religions, and other beliefs, and including like non belief and all that sort of thing. Yeah. Um. And it and like the reason why I want to do it is because I grew up. Uh, my dad's Jewish and my mom is Christian and we grew up as a Christian household, but with my dad teaching us mm -hmm. about Judaism and, and I went to a school in Richmond that was primarily Jewish. Like it was very, very predominantly Jewish. Basically it was Jew Jewish and Chinese. There was just like the neighborhood. Right. <laughs> and, uh, and so like I grew up like in, in grade three, we watch or grade two, I think we watched a Sesame Street special in class about Hanukkah, mm -hmm. right? And and it's the sort of thing that like I grew up with that. And then as I got older and like I talked to people about it, it was like, what are you talking about? Like yeah. they didn't show that to us in in <laughs> elementary school, right? Yeah. right? Um, and it's the sort of thing that like I know that I was exposed to to different beliefs, mm -hmm. um, especially moving from Vancouver to Penticton. <laughs> It was, it, there's culture shock there, yep. right? Because you move from a, a metropolitan city mm -hmm. or a suburb of a metropolitan city to uh, basically Super, like a small yeah, town, yeah. right? I mean, mm -hmm. like it's a city, but it's a small town no, mentality. It's small. It's small. Um, and, and that is predominantly white, like, the, yeah. like just like oh, straight up. Straight up white. Yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. Like, um. It was something that, like, from a young age, I was very aware of. And I want to put together something that, that points these things out, like, that, that explores them so that, like, you expose kids to other people's beliefs. But, like, it's, like, when you approach something like that, when you're thinking about something like that, you have to start thinking very sensitively about it okay. and compassionately and empathetically because you don't want to, you don't want to be... Uh, yeah, you 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 can't portray bad guys as one thing, mm -hmm. right? And yeah. because kids are very quick to label, they're very yeah. quick to categorize. Yeah. Because That's how human beings are very quick to categorize, yeah. yeah. And they don't have the breadth of experience yeah. to know that the one example that they found isn't yeah. all examples, right? Yeah. yeah. Um. And so, like, it's just that it's it's one of those things that that I think that like as a writer writing for children. Mm -hmm. Or young young adults, because mm -hmm. the Harry Potter books kind of transition from children's yeah. books to young adult books. I think you need to be very aware of that sort of thing, right? Mm -hmm. Like you need to you need to be subversive mm -hmm. because at that age, that's what they need more than anything, right? Was this the same Romilda? 
No. I'm trying to, I'm trying to think of her name. Or Veronica. It does end it's in like, an Ilda. It Ilda. does end in an Ilda. Yeah, something, something. It's like on the tip of my tongue. It's like a Grimilda. Grimilda Vane. Grimilda Vane, I think. I think it's Grimilda. I feel like it's Grimilda. And and again, like like Anyways, a lot yeah. of the names, a lot of the like, names yeah. are very like. Yeah. Obviously, well, that's a bad so, guy, like, which is honestly, fine. That's a, that's like a Tolkien thing. You right? know what's so interesting about this, Mike? I have just never in my entire like of all the preachy things that I sometimes do yeah. with my like liberal yeah. uh, like mindset and yeah. friend base. I've never talked about the Harry Potter books like this before. Yeah. And it's super weird because I'm kind of like, oh, these are things that I should have been saying. So, but at the same time, I'm kind of like, all I want to do is defend everything yeah. that you're saying. Okay, so, so, it's, so like a weird... it's no different than Star Wars, right? When yeah. people when people come out against Star Wars and they say that Jar Jar Binks is a racist character and I go, absolutely not. Because I'll tell you exactly why he's not a racist character. Because uh, the actor that played him chose to do those things and comes from that background so like he comes off as rastafarian right mm. and then people make generalizations and they and they apply those generalizations to all of the gungans because of the one example that they get which is jar jar and they oh so they're all they're all like lazy blah 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 and like they throw a bunch of insults that it's like okay so you're taking your racist generalizations and applying it to star wars based on a very very small experience of it to me because i experienced star wars at a deeper level Mm -hmm. i look at that and i go like you're being unfair right Mm -hmm. you're not actually watching the movie you're trying to apply a racist stereotype to a character um and really what you're doing is you're picking up on on a culture that an actor has imbued that character with right but then i have to take a step back and mm-hmm. remove myself from my love of Star Wars mm-hmm. and see it how other people see it and go, yeah, Jar Jar Binks can come off as, an, as a racist character. The, the Nemoidians mm-hmm. do come off. That, that accent is vaguely Asian. Mm-hmm. And I, it never occurred to me because I yeah. watched and I went like, oh, they have alien accents. Yeah, yeah. Right? Because it's yeah, not, it's the thing. It's the thing it's not just, specifically exactly. one thing. It's yeah. just, but like... Then you take a step back and you try and see it from somebody else's perspective and you go, oh no, that is, and okay, in the trade dispute and they just, they're all about money. I see how people are drawing these lines, but it's always really funny to me because whenever the, the, the racial profiling is applied to, to a Star Wars race, I always find it really, really funny because it's always the stuff that everybody says about every other race, mm. right? It's like it's like the 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 money thing I always find really really interesting because um, in a city like Vancouver where we have a very dense Asian population, a lot of the time you hear people make racist stereotypes and generalizations about Asian people that has to do with money, right? Mm-hmm. And greediness and all the stuff that goes along with that. Now, as somebody with the last name Cohen, especially as someone with the last name Cohen that was openly of Jewish heritage living in Penticton, I heard a lot of jokes about how I was cheap because I was Jewish, right? And like how I I never I wasn't generous because I was Jewish, right? <laughs> like like oh, like I must love money and blah blah. Like people like I had friends who would make these jokes to me. And it's funny because like it's it's the sort of thing that like every every uh, group I think generalizes about another group that they see as being in a better position than them. Mm. So like in Vancouver, we have a lot of like realtor realty or sorry real estate owners mm-hmm. that are Asian because we have a dense Asian population. It has nothing to do like it mm. it. So you end up with this weird generalization. Well, I'm sorry, <laughs> just like for one second though. Yeah. The housing crisis in Vancouver oh, no, no, no. is a it, real thing. Yeah, when it's it comes a real to, thing. Like, it's a real thing. But, like, but but people but people want to attribute certain yeah, things. Yeah, I understand what you're talking because, about. Because because it's part of an agenda rather yeah. than looking at facts. Yeah. Right? So so yes, th- there is fact based stuff to look at in that example, but that's not what people are actually talking about. What people are talking about are racist s- stereotypes. Well, so 
Yeah. And I can, so, like, I think with Harry Potter, because Harry Potter is one of those franchises similar to Star Wars, similar to Star Trek, similar to The Lord of the Rings, that, it, like, if you're a fan of it, you become... Uh, this is a term that, that Mark Hamill uses for, like, the hardcore Star Wars fans, uh, ultra-passionate fans, mm-hmm. right? That, like, go the nth, to the nth degree, that, like, that know more about the movies than, than the people who made them or the books yeah, or yeah, whatever, yeah. right? And and I know that you have some friends who are in that camp for Harry Potter. Yeah. And yeah. that you are somewhat in that camp, right? Like, yeah. Well, not what, as hardcore as some of your friends, because I know some of your yeah, friends are like, like really crazy. It's like their <laughs> yeah. thing, right? Yeah. But but it, I think because because you're surrounded by people who are in that camp, the discourse is about what's great about Harry Potter and very seldom about like what the what might be the like you you forgive the problems because because you're so passionate. About them. No, I want to take a step back. I, my criticism is actually of myself, not of yeah. the book. Everything you're saying is true for all literature, mm-hmm. almost. Like, like what you're saying, like, the, th- the things that you're picking apart right yeah. now about Harry Potter are things that are so prevalent, I've, I never pick them apart in stuff. Yeah. Because to do so would mean that I could never enjoy anything. Like, and, and I mean, that's, like, part of why I study, like, critical thought so that so that I have a time and a place where I'm like let's mm-hmm. sit down and critically analyze this and this is great and I have friends that will also have conversations about stuff like this but if I went into every single thing that I read yeah trying to like understand the systemic issues with it I could never enjoy another thing ever because yeah. everything has the systemic things yeah so what the ways that you were arguing about Harry Potter I also am like Oh my gosh, what's the solution to that? Because what you were saying yeah. is so true. Children have to use stereotypes yeah. and generalizations to understand the world. That's how you start to understand the world. This is hot. This is cold. Yeah. Everything that looks like this is hot. Everything that looks like this is cold. Be careful when you're around these things. Yeah. Oh, that's a fake thing. You can use that. Oh, why can you use that? Experience will tell you so. Yeah. So, so... The thing that I'm finding fascinating about this is actually like a larger problem that I'm saying, like, how do we break that apart? How do we deal with that stuff? Because if you're talking about children's literature, yeah, it's it only is helped by by systemic changes in how we yeah. as a society view things and slowly but surely having movies like Frozen and movies like like taking apart the idea yep. of like what is a villain and what is a hero yeah. and who can be the stars of things. And that's only like within the last yeah. I mean, decade is even a stretch. I want to say the last like five years yeah. that popular media has started to reflect the idea yeah. that like protagonists can be different people and we can relate to every breadth of hero yeah. if we understand what makes them similar, like what makes them human, yeah. like what makes them be able to connect with us instead of just going like, oh, that person looks like me and is in the same situation as me, I identify with them. Yeah. And starting to recognize being like, no, we can identify with a whole breadth of people. We should start to look at our whole society. And yeah. that's only now that kids are at all exposed to that. So it's just so fascinating that I've never just, I've never looked at Harry Potter that way because yeah. I'm always expecting, especially with you, I was expecting to like have to bat down all the larger like issues with the books. Yeah. And this is just in no way where I thought this conversation was going to yeah, go. Yeah, yeah. And it's truly fascinating. I and just, interesting I think I, for, for me, I think it's more important to let your character's actions speak for themselves and not use not use a, an idea of an outward appearance as the as the primary indicator of of a character's motivations mm-hmm, mm-hmm. because that's really like that's i think that's what what i'm picking up on the most is that she really for a lot of the key characters mm-hmm. she spends a lot of time describing them and a lot of the time that description can is is used to let you know where that character is going to yeah be, yeah right and and like it's not in all cases because like you could absolutely say that like coral is is his outward appearance is subterfuge right like it's used as a as something to throw you off the trail right. of him being the bad guy the whole time and snape's outward appearance right, is yeah. used to make you think that he's the bad guy every yeah. book yeah, yeah right yeah. and every book it turns out that he's not until obviously Half Blood Prince, where it turns out that he is, 
until the last <laughs> book where it turns out that he wasn't actually. Oh man, have you but, watched the like yeah, yeah. Snape in oh, chronological order? No. Oh, oh my gosh, I'm going to send it to you. I cry almost every single time yeah. I watch that thing. Snape's story in chronological yeah. order is it, so brilliant. Okay, so this is my this is a totally superficial gripe that I have yeah. with it. The guy who Jim Dale who does the audiobooks. Mm-hmm. Um he, he does the ones that are on Pottermore because I guess mm-hmm. I who's the guy who does who did them before? Um, oh, it's the guy who did like the Hitchhiker's Guide audiobooks, like the radio dramas. I've and never stuff. like um, listened. To people them. listening will know yeah. what I'm talking yeah, about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But um, the the ones that I'm listening to, the ones that are on Audible mm-hmm. that are that were recently released, mm-hmm. and they're done by Jim Dale, and he intentionally doesn't do any of the movie characters oh, right like he does yeah. them as like different things um he has a few really annoying like it, this happens with everybody who reads audiobooks because you sit and you're listening to them for five hours or in the instance of the entire harry potter series at this point i don't <laughs> know three books in five hours a piece right? yeah, 15 yeah. hours of listening yeah. to this guy he has a very specific way of like oh no and it's like <laughs> shut up guy like like because that's fine if it's hermione she's going oh no that's fine hermione talks like that that's how her character talks but if it's ron ron would be like oh no right like you have to characterize them and he doesn't oh and you get to snape and I'm sorry, but Snape is Alan Rickman, and Alan Rickman is Snape. I've said this before on the, I think on this podcast. I believe that that artists are put on Earth to do one specific thing. Everything else is just gravy, right? For Arnold Schwarzenegger, it was absolutely 100% to play Conan the Barbarian, which was one of his first major roles, and he did it in two movies and. They, he keeps threatening that he's going to come back and do it in another one. And I just stop threatening me with a good time, Conan the Barbarian, Arnold Schwarzenegger, because he's so perfect for it. Like, he is that character. He epitomizes that character. He's perfect in that role. And that movie is only so good because it's Arnold Schwarzenegger. You can't say that about any other movie because Terminator, you could replace him with Sylvester Stallone, same movie, right? <laughs> Doesn't matter, right? Like, all you need is a big dude with a funny accent, <laughs> and we're good to go. Alan Rickman was put on this planet to play Snape. Like, that's why he existed, right? And everything else well, he I mean, did... not so reductive, but no, I understand No, but voice. like, like yeah. as an artist, right? Yeah. Like, I'm talking as an artist. Like, that's what his... Like, that is the crowning achievement of his career, amongst other incredible roles. Like, he's, he's, he's one of the best actors ever, right? Like... Or was, I guess. But, uh, like, Hans Gruber and Metatron and Dogma. And, like, yeah. everything that he's in, he elevates. And he's so good. But, what? <laughs> I'm going to tangent for a second. My buddy, the other day, they were like, name the five angels in the Bible. Because they they used, yeah. they grew up religious or whatever. And so they yeah. named off, I don't know, like, Gabriel and, and all this uh, stuff. Yeah. Yeah, whatever. They, whatever they are. The, the, there's only, apparently, five angels that are named in the Bible. And I was like, yeah. What about Metatron? And they were like, Amanda, that was a character in Dogma. And I was like, and Supernatural? <laughs> Surely that's not... No, the Metatron <laughs> The Metatron is an angel. And if they had actually studied theology, they would know that. Because uh, it's not in the Bible. But it's... Yeah. But it's in the Apocrypha. That the Metatron is an angel. Like cool. that the voice of God was an angel was an that angel. spoke okay. for God. Cool. So, but I think, I think it was... He did. I mean... Nate went to like the like whatever that oh, school yeah. is. Yeah, like he Trinity, straight up yeah, straight up studied theology. Yeah. And then was like yeah, But at Trinity like, but at Trinity, so the Apocrypha is apocryphal. Probably yeah, I was gonna say where the word so, comes from. Yeah. So like somebody like myself who has done that study independently <laughs> yeah, yeah. and not just from the Christian lens, but also through the Jewish lens as well as through other lenses. <laughs> yeah. Um, Literature examination. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. Like, because I personally count uh, uh, Paradise Lost oh, yeah, as, that's interesting. As, okay. as not, not gospel because gospel has a specific word, but as word of God, because the beginning of Paradise Lost starts with with Milton evoking 
the angels oh, to to guide his hand, like oh, to to write. Like he is a he's a he's a utensil, like he's a tool for them oh, to work cool. through, which is no different than how the prophets okay, yeah. would oh. evoke things okay. before they would write. So. So, so yeah, I think, but the, at, the, at its core, they were yeah. talking about how it was, it was in the Bible, in the Bible specifically yeah. used. But anyways, but I, what I thought was interesting. So sorry to tangent no, no, so no, no, that's fine. terribly. I'll always but... tangent into that stuff. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, yeah but, 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 but yeah, like, so to, to do anything, and I don't know specifically when these audio books were recorded. Maybe mm-hmm. they were recorded before the movies. Maybe they were recorded during the movie, like the yeah, first one was recorded yeah. before. And he had to yeah. keep going with yeah, the same with thing for yeah. consistency. But if they were recorded after the first movie came out, then it's a mistake. (laughs) It's a mistake for him to not... He doesn't have to do an impression, but he needs to draw from that experience. Okay. Right? He needs to draw from... Because when Snape opens his mouth in this book, he he talks like this. And it's like... It's like your Snape sounds like Voldemort. Your Voldemort sounds like your Snape. Like, it, <laughs> yeah, we get it. Snape's supposed to sound like a bad guy, but Snape is an iconic character because of Alan Rickman's performance, yeah. right? Yeah. No different than I think Harry's an iconic character because of Daniel Radcliffe's performance, um, especially in the later movies. Yeah. And and um, and and Dumbledore is defined by the two actors that played him. Mm-hmm. Um, and really, like, like those are the iconic characters. Of the, and Hagrid's pretty iconic, the, the actor that they have played. I just don't him. understand who else could have played Hagrid in that same way. I mean, I'm sure there's someone, yeah, obviously, but, but he did um, such a good job. Such a good job. There's a, there's a handful of actors. I think there's, yeah. about, there's about four or five actors that could have done that. Yeah. You know who would have been an awesome Hagrid? John Goodman. If he could oh. do the accent, he'd be an awesome head. Well, right? well, there's a, you know, one of the coolest They're things all British, is to all like watch yeah. is to like look at people's interpretations of like American versions of like who would be cast in like, yeah, the yeah, American yeah. versions of Harry Potter and stuff. It's kind of interesting. Um, so cool. So I you're, love you're Harry alive. Potter. Yeah, I'm a hardcore Harry Potter fan now because of of going through the books. Uh, tomorrow, I'm going to meet a person and off of Craigslist and get a, a brand new copy of all eight movies on Blu-ray for Ooh, 50 bucks. Nice. I'm super excited because nice. as I've been listening to the books, I'm obviously comparing them to the movies because the yeah. movies were my first experience and mm-hmm. I want to, I, I want to watch them. Yeah. Um, it's going to be very hard to watch just the first three right now, yeah. oh, but yeah. I haven't watched the third one. I think I've only seen it once and I consider it my favorite of the, the movies. Third one? Yeah. Oh, it's it's it. Well, it's time travel. That's why I like it. But yeah. it's also why a lot of people don't. But so okay. So just b- right before we finish this yeah. and get into the actual episode of Arrow, mm-hmm. um, the the other thing that bothers me, and it's just the structure of the way that she built out the books, and it has to work this way. And I'm hoping that as you get into Half Blood Prince and Deathly Hallows, mm-hmm. that this will fall away, especially Deathly Hallows because they're not at school. Yeah. Um, but especially in the first book. And the second book, less so in the third, but definitely obvious in the third. Um, the whole middle of the book has no plot and is just action. Oh. Right? Like, not action as in, like, you know, running around. But, yeah. like, it's just stuff that happens. Right, yeah. And because the beginning of the books are always like, okay, something happens with the Dursleys that's going to... It's going to infer something that's going to be important later. Yeah. Um, and, then, and then he goes off to school... And, or he goes to Diagon Alley, and when he goes to Diagon Alley, he's going to encounter one specific thing that's going to be super important by the end of the book. And then he goes to school, and his first three classes that are his new classes this year, he's going to learn things (laughs) that are super important for the course of this book. And then, by the time they get to Halloween, until they get to the end of year, nothing is important. Oh, it's all this sort of stuff cool. happens and it's all character yeah. development, but nothing's important to the plot. So it's like, it's like, this is where, and I know going into the fourth book, this is where Ron and Harry have their falling out because Ron joins the Quidditch team and mm. Harry, I think Harry doesn't, he's not on the Quidditch team in the, in the fourth book, right? Uh, yeah. Is he? Well, no, like, he... like Ron becomes the, the Quidditch know, superstar. Yeah, yeah. There's, there's some reason why he's not. The, the one thing about the third book, the fourth book is that because the trials are separate, like the, the three games, yeah. you do actually get it. It's That's actually true. much more paced That's in a true. very different way. Yeah. 
And then the fifth I'm book. Real, I think I think Goblet of Fire might actually be my favorite because of the Goblet of because of yeah, the, the yeah, games. But, but yeah. The fifth book, the reasons why I loved it and yeah. think that it's important to read the book version, based on what you just told me, is yeah. gonna be not a one that you like. <laughs> they cut out half the book in the movie. Yeah. I think it's an interesting stuff, but it's about the goings on at Hogwarts. It's all the schools. So. And and which is so fun to yeah. me. Like you learn so much about house elves and you learn a ton about um like the school itself. That's and Order you learn, of the Phoenix. Yeah, and, okay. and it's and it's it's like an interesting you learn about because yeah, yeah, yeah. that's the, the one I skew, always I forget about Order about. of the Phoenix. I always yeah. skip right from Goblet of Fire to Half Blood Prince. I yeah. don't know why I but always forget about it's, it. I've it's only really, seen the movie. The once. thing is cause in Order of Phoenix, like very little happens. Yeah. It's all very much about characters and, and like, development of the world. And that's why I love it so much. Like, you okay. learn more about I, prophecy. Don't, and don't, you learn more about yeah. Neville in a way that you never do in the movies. Don't like, get me wrong, so, yeah. because it's not that I don't enjoy the middle of the books. Mm -hmm. It's just that I feel like if she were planning them out a little bit better when she was writing them, the, the first time they go to class in Herbology wouldn't be the Mandrake one. Oh, right, yeah. Right? Yeah, yeah. But it's like, okay, here's our first class of the year, a brand new class, Herbology, and we're going to deal with Mandrakes, which, first of all, deadly Mandrakes, <laughs> first class. Yeah. Right? Like, yeah. let's like, why don't you introduce them to, like, some of the things that they have to grow for their potions first? <laughs> that would be an introduction, too. Yeah. And then you save that for the middle of the book, where it's like, Thank goodness we just got the the shipment of mandrakes and, you know, like it's going to take a couple months for them to mature. But instead of like right off the bat, uh, you know, something's paralyzing these kids and, yeah. yeah, man, there's only like five fantastic beasts right, <laughs> to use their terminology. Like if you're going to go with like, like basic mythology, they, they, I... Uh, would would you, lead you to believe that everybody would have mandrakes? Getting, no, well, that they're getting petrified, but right. like it, it, so. Oh, I know. understand what you mean. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Do some detective work, yeah. Teachers that are apparently experts in all of this stuff. Like Snape always has everything figured out. Yet he like the the teachers never save the day until the last second, and it's and and the thing this it bugs me so much. <laughs> Dumbledore is always there. And he's always watching. And he lets horrible things happen and very dangerous stuff go by because he wants Harry... Because And I know that like this is the whole point of the Half-Blood Prince, right? You get to that book and you find out that Dumbledore, as great of a character and as a hero of a hero as he was, he's also kind of a very flawed character because mm -hmm. he puts the weight of the world, literally, yeah. on the shoulders of Harry Potter when anybody would do, right? Like, not necessarily, but like... But like... He allows certain things to happen because of prophecy yeah. that they should have just dealt with. Yeah. Right? That, like, it were within his power to stop or deal with, but he wants Harry to develop in this certain way. Mm -hmm. So he's almost... He is an Obi-Wan Kenobi type character because, obviously, he's the wizardiest wizard of them mm -hmm. all. But, but there are elements to his character where, like, he kind of just lets things happen yeah. that are very bad yeah. because it's going to be good in the long run. And yeah. it's like, I, I get, like, he's kind of a god character. He's much like Aslan in the Chronicles of Narnia, yeah. where it's like he, like, he understands the balance of good and evil mm -hmm. and the, and, you know, you have to take the good with the bad. Yeah. And everything terrible that Harry goes through is going to um, help him grow as a, as a person, right? And become a better wizard and be able to defeat Voldemort by the end. Also, Voldemort, everybody who's listening, Voldemort. Go. Not Voldemort, Voldemort. That's how you say it. That's how you say it. It depends. That's how you say it. I mean... If, if you read it as Voldemort, you were wrong. Mm -hmm. Yeah, no, you were wrong. It's Voldemort. Like, that's... Like, that J.K. Rowling has said, it's Voldemort. You don't pronounce... The T is silent. Yeah, and, but that's and also throw, my, my, like, uppity French friends who say that it's croissant, not yeah. croissant. Yeah. And I'm like, no... In North America, it's croissant. So <laughs> okay. get over it. Okay. <laughs> like, <laughs> it's, I think it's Voldemort. His name's okay. Voldemort. But I mean, um, it's no different. It's no different than all of the Star Wars fans for years, for like 
almost decades, we all thought it was pronounced Coruscant, and it turns out that it's Coruscant. And okay. we didn't know that until episode one came out. And oh. there's that moment where Qui-Gon Jinn says it to the battle droid, and yeah. he says, I'm taking, I'm taking them to Coruscant. And the battle droid goes, Coruscant? Mm, Coruscant? No, that doesn't compute. And to a lot of fans, that was them going like, why is he saying Coruscant? Like, he's confusing oh. the droid. It's called Coruscant. Oh. <laughs> right? And it's like, no, it's Coruscant. And now everybody says Coruscant because that's what it's supposed to be. Okay, but, but everybody says Voldemort because that's now what it's supposed to be because popular culture says I, I say I, it's Voldemort. It's All right, Voldemort. you can have your year. Yeah. Fine. But then, it, but then it's be... not Tom Riddle, it's Om Riddle. So, whatever. No, that's not the case. That's not the case. <laughs> it's a silent T. It's a silent T in Voldemort, which is a made-up name. Tom is a name that already exists. No. Um, anyways. Harry Potter. It's awesome. I love okay. it. Yay. It's good. I need to find a stand for my wand so that I can put it up. I think I'm going to put it over the mantle. Ooh. But I think what I need to do is I need to find a stand for two wands so that when Crystal Lee gets a wand eventually, then uh, we can put them both above the mantle. Yeah. I guess maybe I should. Well, eventually I'll have to get three. I was going to say Eventually I'll have to get more. Yeah, um, yeah cause, cause the Wizarding World is open in California now. It's not officially open yet. I think it officially opens in the middle of April, but it is open to the public Ooh. now. Um, nice. cool. I want to go so bad. I want to go so bad. I didn't know. This and just go to that and not spend any time in the rest of Universal because the rest of Universal is garbage, garbage. but just, <laughs> garbage. just, and like yeah. have, ha, I don't even know, like, will what butter beer be good? What do or? they have? It's like a split thing, right? Where one part of the world is in Florida and the other part is in LA, like of the Wizarding World. Um, right? No, no, they both have Hogwarts. Um, and then well, one has Diagon Alley and the other one has like yeah, I think they have Hogwarts Diagon Alley in in the one here. Yeah, because yeah. they have Ollivanders and everything, and the other yeah, one has Hogsmeade. Hogsmeade. Yeah, okay. The yeah. Florida has Hogsmeade. Yeah. Um, and I would rather have Diagon Alley. Wouldn't you? Wouldn't you? Yeah, rather have I think Diagon I'd rather Alley. Win. Yeah. Well, I don't know. We'll see. I just want to go I'm all of Andrews so bad. So oh, and I just bad. want to go. I haven't been to any of them. Like, I, I yeah. haven't been to Florida since I was, like, five. So I haven't been to... I would like to just go to Disney World I just, again. I just... I wonder... I wonder if when you go in, they ask you, like, if you've already been sorted, if you've already... Oh, yeah, like, because with Pottermore... Like, because I just recently did... I did it before when it originally opened yeah. and was sorted into Hufflepuff. And then they reopen it, like yeah, they they, they did it, yeah. yeah, like with because of Fantastic Beasts, they like re yeah configured yeah. the whole site, like they basically built a new site and and they changed the 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 quiz or whatever, yeah. and it sorted me into Ravenclaw this time. Very interesting. And so it's like there's conflict there because like you identify right when you yeah. start to identify, you go okay, this is who I am, yeah. and then to have it tell you that it's something different, but it also you also get to choose like not choose. But do the thing for your wand. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And, and... Oh, and then when you go to Ollivander's... If you yeah, know. and if I went to Ollivander's at, at Universal and he gave me a unicorn hair, <laughs> I'd be like, this is nonsense, Ollivander. <laughs> that is not my wand. Yeah. My wand has a dragon heart string and it's made of... I... Uh, I... Uh, it's mm-hmm. not oak. Mine's fur. I can't remember... Uh, Maple? I think it's maple. And which is funny because Canadian. But I uh, and uh, and it's and it's slightly springy. Ooh. Yeah. Nice. Um, that yeah, that would be that would be the coolest thing to go. Yeah, I was really I didn't take the first quiz. Yeah. But I always identified as a raven claw. Yeah. Uh, no. A slither claw. I was a slither claw. Because I was yeah. both like slither and a raven claw. But then I finally sorted myself and was like officially put in slither in. But now every time I see Ravenclaw stuff, I'm a little bit like, because I identified for so long as both. Yeah. And now I'm like, oh, I'm only one. But I'm like, no, at heart. I'm well, like I, always, I, I always, I always identified like Hufflepuff, but I have very sli- uh, a very Ravenclaw tendencies yeah. because I'm yeah. very uh, analytical and yeah. blah, 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 yeah. stuff. And like, I'm okay with it. It's, oh, it's fine. It's not a big mm-hmm. deal, but it's the sort of thing that like, if I went to, if I went there and then the sorting hat put me in Gryffindor, I'd be mm-hmm. like, sorting hat, you don't know what's up. Yeah. It would, it would break the experience yeah. for me. And it's, yeah. it would, it would bug me. Yeah. It would bug me. Anyways, let's talk about Harold. Okay. I just want to do a podcast about Harry Potter right now because I'm really into it. Yeah. Um, okay. Doing a regular schedule. Yeah. Well, I think I just got it all out. 
<laughs> uh, we'll, we'll, there, there will be a part two to this conversation. Yeah. Once you're done. Once I finish yeah. the, the next Good. few books. Uh, okay. So there we go. That is the first episode in the bag. Thank you very much for joining me. Uh, Of course, uh, you can keep an eye on irregularlyscheduled.com for more content Uh, coming soon, coming eventually, coming at some point. I, uh, whenever I feel like it, that's the whole point. I, uh, you can also follow us on Facebook, facebook.com slash irregularly scheduled and on Twitter. Uh, I believe it's a regular pod. Uh, you can follow me personally. I'm at ArkWolf, A R K W U L F. And of course, we are part of the Thunderquack Podcast Network. Head to thunderquack.com to check out all of the other podcasts in the network. And if you enjoy what you're listening to, uh, you can head to patreon.com slash thunderquack, become a supporter, and help us bring more great podcast content like this to you. Uh, That's it for the first episode. Again, thank you for joining me, and uh, I will see you when I see you.